So good afternoon, everyone. I thank Ramanujan College, uh, particularly for organizing this discipline-based lecture series uh, dealing with issues related to Indian economy. And of course, for inviting me uh, to deliver a lecture on global production network and strategies for industrialization in India. Now, I would share uh, the slides. So the title of my lecture is Global Production Network in India, Structural Asymmetries and Strategies for Industrialization. What I'm going to do in this lecture is basically, uh, I will talk about the emergence of this uh, new production organization, Global Production Network, and try to locate India in this global production network. But at the same time, uh, what I am arguing in this lecture is basically that participation in the global production network does not necessarily increase our share in the global value added because there are certain asymmetries which exist and we need to identify those asymmetries and accordingly strategize our process of industrialization. Now, to begin with, if we see the history of industrialization, we'll find that the process of industrial development is very much linked to a process of separation of production and consumption. So in the very early phase of human civilization, in isolated, self-contained villages, people used to produce things and services which were actually consumed by the people who reside in that particular village only. So production and consumption site was the same. So what is being produced in a particular region, it has to be consumed by the people who reside on that particular region. But as we see that uh, gradually when industrialization in different phases happened, it was basically driven by uh, the uh, uh, movement of goods, people, and ideas in different phases. And we can trace this development of industrialization with the different phases of movements of, of goods, people, and ideas uh, with the development of technology. Now, let me begin by uh, talking about the first unbundling that happened, which was uh, vividly discussed by Richard Baldwin. Uh, but he says that uh, the first unbundling is basically the invention of steam and water power, which uh, facilitated the growth of roadways and waterways. And that has led to a drastic fall in trade costs. As a result of which, the goods and services which were produced in a particular region need not to be consumed only by those people who reside in that particular region, but it can be traded across regions. And at the same time, those who are residing in that particular region need not have to consume what is being produced in their villages only, but they can consume things which can, which can be brought from different parts of the world. So a separation of production and consumption happened, uh, and we can locate this first unbundling uh, during the period 1830 to 1870, which was also uh, the process of globalization happening during that period of time. And there was this was a regime of free trade where goods and services moved across geographical boundaries and not only goods and services, huge labor migration happened during this period of time. Now, this separation of production and consumption, or the first unbundling, of course, led to a dispersion or a spatial dispersion of production. But at the same time, it led to a kind of specialization and regional concentration as well. Why this happened? Because even if uh, the production process or the, or, the, or the different goods and services were now being traded and being produced in different parts of the world. But in order to have this production process uh, done, what was required is a process of coordination. You can coordinate different activities related to a production only when they are located in close proximity to each other. 
So in order to minimize coordination cost, what was required is a proximity of different activities in that in, in, in this particular region. And that caused a kind of what we can say industrial concentration in, 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 in regional concentration in different, different parts of the world. So in order to take the advantage of economics of scale, as well as uh, to take uh, the advantage which has been created by uh, what we can say comparative advantage because of uh, uh, certain endowments, or natural endowments in particular regions, what was required is that a kind of concentration of industries in particular region. Now, this led to what we can say a kind of north-south divergence. And, and this was not a one-time one time thing. In the sense that this divergence in terms of industrial con concentration and specialization uh, created a cumulative effect. So it basically led to a kind of widening technology gap and innovation gap because the countries in the north who industrialized faster, they could acquire the capabilities of innovating new technologies. And because of that, what happened is that they, they advanced in terms of new technology. Progress happened in those lines, but the developing south to some extent lagged behind in terms of those capabilities, widening the gap between uh, the technology gap between these two regions. The second unbundling happened because of the development of communication technology. Now, this is very important because of the development of communication technology, communication costs declined. As a result of that, you can drastically reduce coordination cost because you can coordinate complex processes from a distance. You do not require this proximity of different activities in a particular region in order to take advantage of specialization. Rather, the, since the communication costs decline, you can break down the production processes into smaller tasks and performances, which can be dispersed farther according especially in different regions. Now, this is basically the rise of global production network, which evolved, of course, during the 1940s, but we see further progress and it becomes a dominant kind of production organization or international division of labor since 1970s. Now, one important thing is that this global production network, therefore, is based on the technological capabilities of the North and at the same time relying on cheap labor and natural resources of the South. What we find is that this is a specialization in tasks. So here the regions are not producing final products. Uh, they are basically focusing on performing particular tasks that actually increase the opportunity of developing countries to integrate with the global production network. Because what happens that even if a developing country which has labor surplus uh, may focus on producing a labor intensive component, which can finally be included into a high tech sophisticated final product. So even if this country is not able to produce a high tech fin a final product, but it can concentrate in, in producing a labor intensive component of that product. So that gives an opportunity for developing countries to participate in global production network. Now, some people say that this created a new paradigm of industrialization, where they argue that you do not require to create long term infrastructure and strategies for industrialization in order to develop your industrial base in a particular country, what is required is that you get inserted into the global production network, specialize on particular tasks, and gradually diversify uh, from, from this narrow task to different compositions, and you industrialize on the basis of global demand. 
Now there are a lot of controversies on on these strategies. We'll come to those those issues as we move forward. But two things I want to mention: that uh, global production network or the dynamics of this chain depends upon different development dimensions or dimensions of development of technology as well as the different forces of dispersion and agglomeration. Now, firstly, the question of technology. Now, if the development of coordination technology is faster relative to other developments of technology, then we will find that this will actually increase specialization because it reduces specialization cost. So what you can do, so if, if, if coordination cost reduces because of the development of communication technology, you can break down the, the, the product into further simpler tasks, which can be spatially distributed into different regions once again. So this actually reduces specialization cost. So specialization increases because of the development of communication technology. Now, if there is a development of information technology, which essentially uh, develops the qualities of multitasking, it facilitates multitasking. So in that sense, it helps consolidation of different activities into a single fix. In that sense, development of IT actually reduces benefits of specialization because you can combine different tasks into one, one fix. So the benefits of specialization gets reduced. So in that sense, the development of coordination technology actually facilitates specialization, while the development of IT actually facilitates consolidation because it reduces benefits of specialization. The second important dimension is related to forces which actually uh, facilitate dispersion and agglomeration. Now, dispersion can be of two types. One is what we say vertical dispersion or vertical specialization, which essentially depends upon wage differential. So you try to offshore and outsource production process in regions where wages are relatively less. But at the same time, it, 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 the, the wage differential is not the only cause of dispersion. Because uh, even if wages are low, if, these, if particular regions do not have the capability to produce that particular component, which may be a high-end or a technology-intensive component, just because wages are low, the, so jobs and activities would not be relocated to that place. So horizontal dispersion is basically dependent upon capabilities rather than wage differential. And one can say that dispersion of activities happen for both of these reasons. One is vertical specialization, which depends upon wage differential. And the other is horizontal dispersion, which is basically dependent upon your technological capability. So these two forces, which causes dispersion, but there are also forces which are related to agglomeration, and they are also active. And you see agglomeration forces uh, are basically related to certain factors where producers try to locate their activities closer to large markets uh, because they can easily sell their products in those markets. And at the same time, the other kind of agglomeration that happens where producers and intermediate suppliers, they concentrate in a particular region because that actually increases external economics. And that is basically the reason why we find industrial districts emerge where farms and producers take advantage of each other and that creates agglomeration or concentration in a particular region. So my first point is, that if we see the global production network, there are certain forces and elements uh, which are active and which causes the forces of dispersion as well as agglomeration. And there are the dimensions of technological development also influence the, the, the development of production networks, 
whether it will expand towards further specialization or it will consolidate into lesser number of phases. Now, of course, uh, we see that there had been a relocation of production that has happened during this period of time. And that relocation is basically relocating manufacturing activities from global north to developing countries, particularly industrializing economies in the developing south. Now, if we see that during the period 1820 to 1990, so in a long stretch of time, if you see that the share of G7 countries in world GDP that has increased from one fifth to two thirds during this period of time. But since 1980s, the share of G7 countries in world GDP uh, tend to decline, and it declined faster since 1990. And now the share of G7 countries in world GDP has, is basically close to 50%, which was once around 66-67%. If we see the manufacturing value added growth rate, during the period 2000 to 2016, if we take the average manufacturing value added growth rate, in case of industrial economies, the growth rate or the advanced Economies, the growth rate of manufacturing value added was as low as 1.3%. But in developing and emerging industrial economies of the global south, there the manufacturing value added growth rate on an average was 6.5% during this period. If you see two decades, if you consider two decades, 1990 to 2010, we'll see that the share of BRICS countries in global export of parts and components that has increased from 0.78% to 14%. If you consider the non-OECD and non-BRICS Asia, uh, their share in global exports of parts and components has increased from 4.6% to 9% during this period, while the share of OECD countries in the global share of exports of parts and components has declined from 92% to 70%. On the other hand, if you see that the top 100 multinational companies have shifted 60% of their production and global sales to foreign affiliates. This is sometimes referred to as new nomadism. And this has been discussed by, uh, widely by uh, uh, what one can say, uh, island hopping. It is. It has been discussed by Puga and Venables, and we we see a lot of literature and discussion, particularly of Paul Krugman and Tony Venables, discussing on these developments. What is basically what they basically try to say that if production is happening, say in a particular country, and if you find out a place where the wages are relatively less you tend to offshore or outsource those uh, production activities related to labor and related to those resources into that particular region where the wages are low. And wages, when increase in this new region once again, after a certain period of time, you basically move to another region where the wages are relatively less. And this has also been discussed, a similar kind of idea we see applying this uh, development of industrialization in the context of Southeast Asia. What I'm basically saying that to so the movement or relocation of production, uh, depending upon uh, the uh, increase of wage, when it reaches a certain threshold level, you relocate production to another site where the wages are low. This has been the strategy and that actually increased intra-farm trade. If you see intra-farm trade, which is offshoring and outsourcing, that accounts for 40% of world trade today. So a large amount of world trade is basically intra-farm trade. But why this trade happens? Why uh, farms take recourse to offshoring and outsourcing? And we see that McKinsey Global Institute they give an estimate that offshoring reduces the cost of production of a farm 
by about 40 to 60 percent so if you can reduce the production cost to a great extent by this process but at the same time we should also remember that of course there had been a relocation of production particularly manufacturing happened uh, towards the developing south but developed countries still account for 55.6 percent of manufacturing value added according to the calculation of 2016 and and also if you if you see the composition of relocation it is basically concentrated on five industrializing developing countries which are brazil indonesia india china and mexico only these five countries within the large group of developing countries they account for half of manufacturing value added in 2016 and and in, in 1990 their share was half in 2060 it has increased to three-fourths so only these five countries industrializing countries they account for three-fourths of the manufacturing value added produced in developing countries if you consider china we'll see that within the developing country group they increased their share during this period from 15% to 55%. So more than half of, of the manufacturing value added produced by developing countries is actually produced by China. In case of India, it has increased from 5.8% to 7.7%. So not a very impressive rise. If you consider in the world manufacturing value added, from the period 1990 to 2016, the share of India in global manufacturing value added has increased from 1.1% to 2.8%. But in the same period, China increased the share in world manufacturing value added from 5% to 25%. What is important that with this global integration, uh, if you see the figures of gross exports, they actually do not uh, do reflect the actual domestic value added created in that particular country. So what I'm saying that there is a deviation between gross exports and domestic value added. What a country is exporting is not of the value which is being, which is which is which it is it is selling to another country the whole of the value is not actually created in in that particular country with global integration what we rather find that the domestic value added entering into foreign final demand has declined it has declined for almost all countries and that is being reflected by a rise in the deviation of domestic value added and gross exports so if you see the figures of domestic value added and gross exports the deviation between the two has increased as you see as you see in the graph but after 2009 and roughly you can say from 2012 there is a decline in this deviation and this is precisely because after the financial crisis there has been a contraction in global production network so a rebalancing of growth was happening in different countries. Countries were not relying much on backward linkages. So a contraction happened, which actually increased the share of domestic value added in gross exports. Now, this has been reflected if we see in different sectors as well. Now, we are talking about world gross exports and domestic value added. If you see that the share of agriculture and allied sector in world gross exports is 2.02%. But if you see the share of agriculture and allied in domestic value added going into foreign demand, it is 3.47%. So it is higher than the share in gross exports. While in case of manufacturers, you will find that the share in gross exports is much higher than the share in domestic value added. What is important is that in case of manufacturing and industry, the share of gross exports are actually overvalued, while in case of agriculture and services, it is undervalued. 
because many of the services are included in manufacturing value added. So it has been calculated while and in, in incorporated in manu manufacturing value added rather than separately being considered as services value added. Now, if we look into different countries, we will see that in two, three time points, 1995, 2010, and 2015, we'll see that the share of domestic value added in gross exports generally declined across countries, but in few, in case of, say, in case of uh, uh, um, Canada, we will see that the share of domestic value added in gross exports have increased during this period of time. But I'm not going into that. But generally, the trend is that the domestic value added uh, share in gross exports has actually declined. So this is basically a reflection of increase in backward linkage. So you more and more depend upon intermediate inputs being imported from other countries. So this is basically because of the expansion of global production network. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that backward linkage contracts as per capita income of a country increases beyond the threshold. So beyond the threshold, as the per capita income increases beyond the threshold, what happens? You depend less and less on other countries for intermediate inputs so the backward linkage actually contracts. So what we see that the domestic value added content in the gross exports increases in these countries. And that is precisely the reason why we see that in case of UK and US, even if after the emergence of global production network, the domestic value added increased. In case of China, domestic value added increased significantly uh, during the period 1995 to 2010. What is also important that if you if you compare the figures between 2015 and 2010, in most of the countries you will find that the, the, the share has actually, uh, the, the domestic value added component in gross exports have actually increased. And that I mentioned earlier, that because of the contraction of global production network, uh, as a response to the financial crisis, what happened that the backward linkages contracted for almost all countries, which is being reflected by a rise in the share of domestic value added in gross exports. Now, in the context of India, let us see what has happened and how we can see India's performance in, in global manufacturing value added. In case of India, domestic value added fell sharply as a share of gross manufacturing exports by about 23 percentage point in one decade. So this is a very significant fall of domestic value added in gross exports. It has declined also in case of construction and services, but the fall is much higher in case of manufacturing. What is also important to note that if we see the share of gross exports in GDP, that has increased. So the contribution of gross exports in GDP of a country has increased. But at the same time, if we compute the domestic value added share in gross exports, we will see that that has declined. In case of India, the share of gross exports to GDP has increased by 13.2 percentage point, while the share of domestic value added in gross exports declined by 14.7, so roughly 15 percentage point decline, which is a very sharp decline. And this has also been manifested in the foreign value added in gross exports in India during the period 1995 to 2011. We will see that the foreign value added share in gross exports actually increased from 12.6% and, and, and then uh, it reached to 36.1%. So 36.1% of gross exports of India basically rely on foreign value added. In case of services, it increased from 5.7% to 12.1%. If we consider that which are the sectors in industries of India where we see high foreign value added, high in the sense where the where the share of foreign value added uh, 
to 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 gross exports is more than 30 percent and we will see that uh, in case of computer equipment electrical equipment transport equipment motor vehicles machinery metals and chemicals these are the sectors where the share of foreign value added is much higher in gross exports while the share of uh, foreign value added in gross exports is relatively less less than 10 percent uh, that is low foreign value added is basically invisible in sectors such as real estate education financial intermediation agriculture and allied services activities and mining and querying and computer related services so it is easily understandable that these are relatively less traded sectors and there we see a low foreign value added in cross exports what is important to note is that the sectors which are more integrated with global production network in the sense that where the share of foreign value added is high and also we see that the foreign direct investment is basically uh, targeting these these sectors are the sectors which are technology and capital intensive sectors so these are the sectors which are more globally integrated and there i want to make one point that if you see the pattern of relocation which are the industries which are actually relocated from the advanced countries to the developing south and if you see the pattern you will find that what has happened during the recent decades uh, because of the financialization uh, capital uh, there is a cheapening of capital capital is easily available so there is a tendency of substituting labor by capital now in those industries where capital labor substitution or elasticity of substitution is more than one there you will find that labor is being substituted by capital intensive technology in advanced economies in sectors where the elasticity of substitution is less than one there you will find that their substitution didn't happen in in their countries or, uh, in advanced countries rather relocation happened because since you are not able to substitute to a great extent labor by capital what you have to do is to find out places where labor is available at a cheaper rate and this is precisely the reason why we find that where the elasticity of substitution is relatively less these are the sectors in manufacturing which are relocated to the global south now the point is of course this relocation uh, what has happened and the sectors which have been relocated are relatively labor intensive sectors according to advanced economy standards but these are not labor intensive sectors in, in, in developing economic standards and in standards in the sense if you if you see the factor uh, endowments or the factor shares that exist in developing countries and these are the segments as i mentioned those are chemicals transport equipment motor vehicles these are medium and high-tech industries which are relatively capital intensive industries according to factor intensity of developing countries so so it is not that the, that the manufacturing sectors which have been relocated to the developing countries are like uh, textiles, leather, or footwear, which are basically labor-intensive sectors. Rather, the relocation happened mostly, and the global integration is higher in sectors which are relatively technology and capital-intensive sectors. Now, one can say, OK, fine, that you start with labor-intensive a component production and then gradually diversify and what uh, GPN literature basically suggests what Kaplinsky and, and Cherefi actually argues that you can move up the ladder you can increase the share in value added uh, by moving up the ladder by two uh, two important modes one is what we say upgradation and the other is governance because as they analyze their chains are basically repositories of rents they use the superior notion of economic rent where you can create rent uh, purposefully by creating a scarce assets 
Now, this can be technology events, which can where you create scarce assets by product and process innovation. You can also have a privileged access on a particular natural resource that also can gives you a rent. What is important that if it is a process of technological upgradation, which allows a particular producer to earn a premium over and above the average rate of profit, this can continue for a certain period. Once the technology gets diffused, uh, what happens is that the producer surplus is gradually converted into consumer surplus. So you cannot actually earn rent on a continuous basis for eternal time for one time technological upgradation. Rather, what needs to be done is a continuous creation of productive assets which has to be protected by coordination and governance. This is important because only creation of productive assets does not ensure cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, uh, rent in the sense that you cannot derive rent cumulatively uh, uh, you just by creating assets. You have to establish property right. You have to establish entry barriers so that if other capital wants to enter and wants to use this knowledge or this technology, then a certain rent you would be uh, you would be demanding from that particular capital. That's the way you create rent. The the uh, the point by which or the modes by which you can increase this income or or your rent in the global production network is one is governance, which is defined uh, by Jeremy as the position in the authority and power relation that defines the rules of distribution of resources. So where this country or where this particular state which you are performing is located in this power relation in the global value chain that is important and the suppliers are supposed to internalize those rules. And the governance basically depends upon complexity of transactions, codifiability of information, and competence of suppliers. So these are the three factors which actually influence governance in the sense your location in the, in the authority and power relation of global value chain. The other important factor is, of course, by which you can increase your share in the global value added is upgradation, which is simply augmenting your unit value through product and process innovation. What I try to mention is that, of course, this is the way by which you can innovate, you can augment your unit value and can get a greater share in the global value chain. But so far, uh, uh, studies on developing countries are not very, are not very stimulating. In the sense, this is a, this is a very important study by Milberg and Winkler, which spans from a period of 1990 to 2006 and covers 30 developing countries. It says that none of these 30 developing countries actually manifest strong absolute upgrading. Now, what do we mean by strong absolute upgrading? It means that in a particular sector or in a particular industry, if the labor productivity growth is faster than the growth of exports of that industry, then we say that it is it is experiencing strong absolute upgrading if the growth of labor productivity is is lower than the growth of its force then we say that it manifests weak absolute upgrading if the growth of labor productivity is less than half of the growth of exports then we say that no upgrading is happening and what milberg and wickler study suggests that only nine of these 30 countries show weak absolute upgrading. None of the countries show strong absolute upgrading. So basically, uh, it is uh, it is it does it, it is not so optimistic uh, uh, the results that we see that during this period uh, the developing countries actually did not upgrade the way uh, we see. Uh, it can be done in terms of upgradation and governance. What is also important that, uh, of course, developing countries can increase their gross value of exports 
but the, if you see that the butter terms of trade between developing countries and European Union, uh, that has declined during the period 1986 to 2006, particularly in labor intensive segments like clothing, footwear, furniture and chemicals, where the fall in unit price is about 40%. So during this period, even if uh, developing countries might have increased their export volume, but there is a sharp fall in unit price. Now, this is being reflected in the smile curve, which, uh, which many of the international reports, particularly World Bank and other studies also refer to. And this is a stylized curve, which show the, the distribution of value added in different phases of production. And what we see that uh, the lowest share in value added is, is recorded by countries and regions. Which, which are involved in manufacturing and standardized services. So the, the countries which are involved in manufacturing, they get the lowest share in the value, uh, in the uh, global value added in these production networks. And, and, and on the one hand, those who are involved in basic and applied R&D design commercialization, these are basically advanced countries, uh, where they, they accumulated this kind of knowledge and they get the, the largest share of the value added which has been produced. And on the other hand, those who are involved in marketing, advertising, brand management, specialized logistics, these are the regions, countries or activities, they also account for a larger share of the value added. So those who are involved in manufacturing, they get the lowest share. And it is not only that they are getting the lowest share. Over a period of time, there are estimates of smile curve which suggest that the smile curve has deepened over time. So the difference between the manufacturers and those who are involved in design or in logistics in terms of a share in value added has actually increased. So relatively, the manufacturing countries or the regions which are involved in manufacturing activities, their share have relatively declined. And this is something what one can say, Kaplinsky argued that this is basically, uh, uh, we see uh, the re-emergence of Trebisch Singer thesis, who discussed in the context of Latin America in the 60s, that more and more these countries were involved in exports of agricultural products since the barter terms of trade between agriculture and industry shows a declining trend. So more and more they integrate that actually leads to a lesser and lesser share of the value added. So, so this, is, this was called as emissarize and growth. And we find a similar kind of phenomenon perhaps happening now not in terms of agricultural exports and, and industrial imports, but between light manufacturing and high and medium tech manufacturing. And as I mentioned, that in many of the sectors which are later in labor intensive manufacturing, the barter terms of trade uh, between developing countries and the European Union shows uh, a, a massive fall of about 40%. What happens that the competition between developing countries to get a larger share of the market uh, is basically gives rise to a kind of race to the bottom. So countries like India, Malaysia, China, Philippines, Bangladesh, they compete with each other in order to get a larger share of the manufacturing value added. And in this process, in order to get a larger share of the advanced economy markets, what happens that they rely on lower wage. Now, of course, in different phases, these countries relied on lower wages, but some countries continue to compete on the basis of that. And while they compete with each other, uh, actually it creates this race to the bottom where the share of developing countries as a whole declines. And at the same time, the premium received by multinational companies who actually purchase these components and who actually pay for the task, uh, their, their profit increases. Now, let us discuss the structural asymmetries which exist. And there, I will say that 
if you if you talk about value added, what is the arithmetic of value added? Uh, it is very simple in a particular stage. One can say it is basically the difference between the output value and input value. And the difference between the output and input is basically uh, the, the uh, value added in a particular state. What is important that even if output value remains same, if you can reduce the input value, uh, then the value added recorded for the particular stage increases in the sense that if you can reduce the input price, which is being produced in preceding stage, then even if the output value of a particular stage remains same, the value added increases. And this actually hides the process of value addition uh, that takes place in this global production network. I'll give one example, one or two examples, which, which are very telling in the sense, which actually reflects how value is being captured. Now take, for example, KP Macklin, they produce, uh, they sell t-shirts, and these t-shirts are fully produced, manufactured in Bangladesh. Now, the Bangladeshi company, if it sells, if they sell this finally produced t-shirt to the multinational company, uh, which is which may be located in different parts of the world, but in case this is a US company, at say $100, which includes the profit of the Bangladeshi entrepreneur, the cost of raw materials and inputs, as well as the wages of the labor, and see the sell price is $100. But KP Macklin is actually sold in retail markets across the world at a profit of 718%. So it will be sold at $818. $818. The, the, the parent company shows that the input price is $100. The final price is $818. I am giving a hypothetical example. So the value addition in the final stage, according to this accounting, is $718, even if nothing is being produced in the final stage. Everything is produced in Bangladesh. But since the US company has a control over the design, over the marketing, over the logistics. And they have patented these designs and this knowledge which is being shared. So what happens, they have a larger share in the value added without producing anything. This is the same story in case of Harmes Polo Shirt, which is also produced in Bangladesh and marketed by US company at a profit of 1800%. So, so what we can see that a large amount of, or the larger share of value added basically goes to those farms who are not actually involved in any kind of manufacturing. So the difference between the manufacturing price and sale price becomes so huge, and that is being backed by the multinational companies, while the manufacturers get a very a uh, low share of the total value added. Take the case of jeans produced in China and marketed by a French fashion house. The cost of production of one jeans is 3.2 euros and it is being marketed by the French company at 50 euros. Same is the story of Puma shoes, the cost of production of which ranges between 3.41 to 7.16 dollars. But it has been marketed by the parent company at around $71. So the huge profit is being made by the parent company without producing anything. The important point is that these companies actually do not produce anything. They do not add any value. And this is possible because of the labor arbitrage which John Smith argues. And we will see that this labor arbitrage exists you can easily take the advantage of this differential wage and differential rate of exploitation because of the immobility of labor. In the process of globalization, there are free, the free movement of capital is being ensured by the process of globalization, but labor is relatively immobile input. And this is precisely the reason why we see even in this process of globalization, differential wages 
and differential rates of exploitation exist in different parts of the world. Just think that the Apple iPods produced in China and the production workers were involved in the production of Apple iPods, they receive a wage which is actually 3.2% of the wage which a US worker would have received in US who would be who had been involved in a similar kind of comparable work. So the Chinese worker is receiving 3.2% of the wage of US production worker. On, a, on the average, the Chinese wage currently is 11.3% of US wage and India's wage is roughly 4.4% of US wage. In many of the uh, labor intensive sectors, say garments, footwear, and this kind of, of this kind of segments. What is important that uh, why this different exists, as I said, it is because of the labor arbitrage, but the other important point is that the rent which can be accrued due to privileged access to certain resources where you establish property right or create entry barriers for other competitors uh, this is being also embedded in an uh, in, in an institutional structure which which uh, protects property rights and what i would say that this institution or the the distribution of this property right is asymmetric across the globe uh, the, the, the inputs which are being, or the, or the activities which have been done by the advanced north, as I mentioned while discussing the smile calf, are uh, those who are involved in designing, in, in, in marketing, in creating logistics, or say in, in, in knowledge intensive inputs, uh, they, get, they get a larger share. Not because that, that is the only input which is required for the production, but because they could establish property right on those inputs. And these inputs or these capabilities have cumulatively grown in, in advanced economies, as we see in the, uh, in the history of industrialization. And as I mentioned about the cumulative growth of technology gap between North and South in the first slide. What is important, that they could establish property right on these resources, which are, which are in abundance, in advanced economics. But the resources which we have more, or the resources which are abundant in developing countries, say for instance, labor and natural resources, they are made easily accessible by global capital. We could not create entry barriers. And the process of liberalization actually dismantled all kinds of protection for these kinds of resources which are abundant in developing countries. So in that sense, there is also a kind of asymmetric distribution of property rights. So the, the resources which are, in, which are in abundance in, in advanced countries are property. They're protected by patents, royalties, and things like that. But the resources which are, which are available in, in developing countries, they are made easily accessible by global capital. There is no protection or entry barrier for that. And that has also a negative impact on but we can say labor share in the GDP, which also has its impact in the domestic demand of goods and services. And this is a World Bank estimate, which says that increase in intermediate goods imports of 4% of GDP results in a decline of labor share to the tune of 1.6% for advanced countries. For developing countries, since the backward linkage is even higher, so what happens that more and more you depend upon intermediate inputs, upon imports, you import intermediate inputs, that actually reduces the share of labor in, in GDP. According to this estimate, in case of the advanced countries, it reduces by 1.6%, but in case of developing countries, it is even higher. So it actually reduces the domestic demand. Now this is my last slide, but I uh, try to, uh, to try to comment on what could be the strategies of industrialization, uh, some salient points in the context of this global production network. Now I would say that the integration uh, in the global integration through this production network is of course important, but uh, 
but that does not actually, uh, that does not mean that this is the only path of industrialization. And we cannot rely only on global production network. Uh, rather, what is important, we need to understand how and where to integrate. Now, one important thing is specialization on tasks, particularly relying on labor intensive assembly activities is not going to sustain for long because you can easily understand that always uh, industries would move to from one place to another once the weight increases and they these are basically put loose industries say the case for garments so they move from china from india to bangladesh to philippines and then to vietnam so as the commodification of that particular task happens the that unit price tend to decline and, and that is also the reason why, even if the volume of export increases, but unit price falls. But the more important point is, therefore, that relying on labor intensive assembly uh, kind of activities, which relies on wage cost, uh, is not sustainable in the longer run. Rather, countries should shift to changing composition of exports, upgrade to high value added activities. And this is precisely the reason why upgradation is very important. But one thing I want to mention is that not necessarily that even if you upgrade, you will be getting a larger share of value added in its global value chain. Because once the industry or the chain is integrated, it, it basically depends upon your position vis-a-vis -vis the normal capital. Now, what is the normal capital? We can say roughly the, which has the average organic composition of capital or the average technology in that particular industry. Now, this industry, which is the normal capital or the farm, which is, the, which, is uh, which is reflecting the normal capital, that also upgrades. Now, if a farm in the developing country, which is integrated into global production network, is undergoing technological upgradation, but if this process of upgradation is slower than the upgradation of the normal capital, even if you upgrade, you will not be able to get a greater share of the value added. So what is required is not only upgradation, but you have to upgrade faster than the technological upgradation of the normal capital in that particular industry. Now, if you want to do that, if a country wants to integrate as well as upgrade, what is required is the lot of knowledge inputs need to be need to be created and and, and this kind of high value added activities demand increased inputs of knowledge and also privileged access to cumulatively created scarce resources so you have to cumulatively create knowledge based uh, uh, scarce assets assets so you have to continuously upgrade in order to create rents which you can derive from this global production network. The final point, which I would say that, of course, many of the countries and some people believe that competition is based on which cost, but that is not actually the case. Uh, global competition is based on uh, unit labor cost. And unit labor cost is a ratio of product wage to labor productivity. Now, if this is the case, that competition is based on unit labor cost, even if wage increases, if the productivity increases faster than the growth of wages, then unit labor cost will come down and the country will become more competitive. So we should not always focus to bringing down wage cost. Rather, what is important is that the productivity growth should be faster than the growth of wages. Wage may increase, but productivity should increase faster than that. And that actually reduces unit labor cost and make the country more competitive in the global production network. So what is important that we need to move towards horizontal specialization rather than relying on wage differential alone and, 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 and so that we can address demands which are, which are dependent on capability. And also when we are integrating into the global production network, we, need, we have certain resources and in the process of trade, we depend upon certain resources which we bring from other countries. Now, when we buy from other countries, there is a trade happening. 
And there, of course, we have certain resources in abundance. So a bargaining can happen on the basis of resources traded. It is not just participation, but we can increase our bargaining power depending upon our enlarged market as well as of our resources in terms of labor and natural resources that we have in case of India and generally in developing countries. So here I stop.